Holy moly. We're gonna be here for a while. Welcome back to another Iceberg video. Today we're gonna be going over the first few tiers of the dark, creepy, scary, and disturbing games Iceberg, created by I Am Tabest on Reddit, also known as Annie Gal on YouTube. Full credit goes to her for the Iceberg, and it will be linked in the description below in full. You may be getting a bit of deja vu with this first part, as a previous version of this iceberg had the first few tiers covered by Hey It's Isaac on YouTube. But seeing as he's unlisted and then relisted the video, and it's been seven months since his last part, I felt someone had to take up the task of covering this behemoth of an iceberg. And along with that, this is a new updated version that has a ton more entries. Now that we have the general formalities out of the way, we need to go over some basic information. And don't worry, I'll do a recap of this in the beginning of each part, as this is going to be a long stretch of videos. The first two tiers will be in this video. These are generally well known in mainstream games, so I'll keep spoilers to a minimum, as people are likely to want to try some of these. Tier 2 will go a bit more into spoilers for older games, but a brief intermission will warn you when that is. Be warned, come the next part, full spoilers are fair game. While it only comes up a few times in these first few tiers, the entries are color-coded with different meanings. Red is for Zornographic games, green is for mods and fan games, orange is for games representing extremist ideologies, and purple is for Zornographic games with an all-ages release. The games on the iceberg are ranked in order of obscurity, not how disturbing they are. So while some of the lower tiers are certainly messed up, don't discount the higher tiers. And while it won't apply now, for a lot of the lower tier games I won't be able to show much, for pretty obvious reasons. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. With all that said, let's not waste any more time. The Resident Evil series is developed by Capcom, starting way back in 1996 on the PS1, and is still going strong today, being one of Capcom's flagship brands. Since the initial release, there has been eight mainline numbered entries, and countless spin-offs of varying quality. The series is one of the highest selling game franchises ever, and is THE highest selling horror game franchise. So if you've never heard of this, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, even if you don't play any video games, there's multiple highly grossing movies and a Netflix show based on the series. Anyways, I know I said I would keep these first tiers brief, and I will, but it can't be emphasized enough how influential this series was, not just to horror games, but games as a whole. With RE4 specifically being a huge influence on pretty much any action-adventure titles at the time, and even now. I'm just going to reel myself in and leave it at that, as there's plenty of videos going over why RE is important and influential. So watch those if you're interested, or just play the games. The remake of RE2 is a great jumping off point, so definitely give that a shot. Amnesia is another heavy hitter in terms of notoriety, being unavoidable back in its heyday. This game was a cash cow for every gaming YouTuber back in 2012 or so, and let me tell you, they milked it dry. Back on topic, the series itself consists of three games, The Dark Descent, The Machine for Pigs, and the most recent title, Rebirth. The games are developed by Frictional Games, who are responsible for a few other games we'll be seeing later on. Each story deals with a protagonist who, well, has amnesia, and is piecing together their various puzzles and their lives in general but I'll leave it at that. The games play heavily with psychological elements, such as an actual sanity meter with various effects, but don't worry, they've got actual monsters as well. The first game holds up just fine, so I'd start there if you plan on getting into the series. Right off the bat, this is without a doubt the highest selling, most popular, and most iconic indie horror franchise of all time, and it's unlikely to be topped anytime soon. The series itself is by Scott Cawthon, a solo indie developer who was the sole creator behind the games until some of the later entries. As of now, however, he's retired from game development. Everyone familiar with the game has heard the story of the game's development, but for those unfamiliar, it was brought about when Scott's previous game's characters were compared to animatronics, and he played off that idea, making FNAF. The game's primary scares come from jump scare based horror, but also ambient noises and tension. The games are mainly set in pizzerias, but have branched out into other locations as well. If you've somehow never heard of this series at all, think of it as a horror-themed Chuck E. Cheese experience. Due to its popularity, it really isn't necessary to continue talking about it, so we're gonna move on. Outlast is a stealth-based first-person horror game and series unique for its camcorder mechanics and for having no way to fight back against your attackers. The first game deals with an investigative reporter investigating a psych ward. The second game deals with a different investigative reporter having to trek through cult territory, trying to find his wife after a helicopter crash left them both stranded. And Outlast 3, known as the Outlast Trials, which serves as a prequel, 
is currently in development at Red Barrels. This is another survival horror series by Capcom, although this one is far more action-based and lighter in tone compared to Resident Evil. The original was developed in-house at Capcom in Japan, but was later given to Blue Castle Games as of Dead Rising 2, who were promptly renamed to Capcom Vancouver. The first two games are set in shopping malls, heavily influenced by Dawn of the Dead. The third and fourth games are more open-worldy, with three generally being well-received, and four being so negatively received that it essentially led to the closure of Capcom Vancouver. Sadly, we're unlikely to see any new entries unless Capcom decides to pick up the series in-house again. The Last of Us 1 and 2 were developed by Naughty Dog and mainly followed the journey of Joel and Ellie, two survivors in a zombie apocalypse. The series is unique for having a super cool take on zombies, basing them off a real-life fungus that turns bugs into zombified husks. This is another one of those massive franchises on the list, so I won't go too deep into it. But in case you haven't heard, The Last of Us 1 is getting a remake from Naughty Dog, so look into checking that out if you've never played these before. Speaking of remakes, Dead Space 1 is currently getting a full remake at EA Motive, with more features being added on and all kinds of small changes being implemented to the game for the better. As for what the game is, Dead Space follows Isaac Clarke as he travels through a mining ship on a repair job, which has been completely overrun by necromorphs, which are mutated corpses of dead organisms controlled by these things called markers. Now I'm not going to go over the entire Dead Space lore here, so definitely play this when the remake comes out. Undertale is a 2015 indie game by Toby Fox, which was inescapable when it blew up. This is another one of those massively popular indie games that doesn't really need too much explanation, as by now everyone knows the twists in Undertale that make it dark and disturbing. And if you don't, then you should definitely give it a try. As a brief rundown of the game, you play as Frisk, a human child who has fallen underground where the monsters are forced to live. You need to escape the underground, either fighting off or befriending monsters along the way. It's also worth mentioning the game Deltarune, which is sort of an alternate universe version of Undertale, and as of now, both chapters of it are free. Similar to Undertale, it can also have some pretty dark themes, so give it a shot. For this iceberg, I'm just going to be talking about Bioshock 1, because it's definitely the creepiest and darkest of the franchise, whereas something like Bioshock Infinite is basically just a regular shooter in a cool setting. You play as Jack, who was caught up in a plane crash over the Atlantic Ocean, which ended with him in an underwater city named Rapture. Now already, this is a nightmare for anyone with a fear of the deep ocean. The city itself is filled with mutants, super soldiers, and all kinds of other baddies. And using plasmids, Jack can get superhuman abilities. Although to get these, he needs to harvest the genetic material from little girls named Little Sisters, who are accompanied by Big Daddies, Bioshock's iconic enemies. Without going into too much more of the plot, the game has lots and lots of dark, creepy, and disturbing elements. But again, I won't spoil any because it still is a game worth playing. Silent Hill is another iconic survival horror series, similar to Resident Evil, but this one deals more with psychological horror elements, rather than physical threats like zombies. Silent Hill 2 in specific has often been touted as one of the greatest horror games and games of all time, because of its story and themes of depression and sexual frustration. This is also the series with some of gaming's most iconic enemies, with the most iconic being Pyramid Head, who originated from Silent Hill 2. Overall, this is definitely a series still worth playing, especially the original three if you haven't. Now while Hitman might not be a scary game, this is the first one on the list where I have to say this also includes dark games, and Hitman is definitely that. Made by IO Interactive, you play as Agent 47, taking various contract jobs and other hits, taking you around the globe to execute executions. The game can get pretty dark, with targets often begging for their lives and being killed in gruesome ways. The latest game as of writing, Hitman 3, is still getting big updates including a new map and game mode, so the series is far from dead and definitely still worth a playthrough. Especially games like Hitman Blood Money and the Hitman Trilogy from 2016 to 2021. Slender was another YouTuber cash cow in 2012. Now everyone should know what the super basic goal of Slender is, but if you don't, you're in a spooky forest looking for 8 pages with a dying flashlight and the Slender Man chasing you. Each page you pick up increases his aggressiveness, and the longer you take, the worse your flashlight becomes. It had a few sequels, web series, and a movie, but it's pretty much completely died off. Especially after the 2014 stabbing involving three 12-year-old girls, which you can go into on your own if you wish. 
Heavy Rain was developed in 2010 by Quantic Dream, the same developers as Detroit Become Human and Indigo Prophecy. The game itself follows multiple characters unraveling the mystery of the origami killer, who uses rainfall to drown his victims. Without diving too deep into the story, it has many dark elements, with a standout choice being whether to kill a father of two in order to save your own son. It's also notable for being the game to spawn the Sean meme. I know who the killer is, Ethan. I can prove your innocence. Earthbound is a classic SNES RPG that served as the inspiration for a lot of games on this iceberg, especially any JRPG ones. The game itself is on the list mainly due to the last stretch of the game, and specifically the final boss, Gygus. Now this is a classic bit of trivia you hear from anything related to Earthbound, but the final boss was inspired by a traumatic event from the creator's childhood, where he entered the wrong theater and witnessed a brutal murder scene that he mistook for a rape scene, which traumatized him to the point that his parents worried for his safety. With that said, while the game has aged a bit compared to modern RPGs gameplay-wise, this is still a game worth checking out as it holds up very well. Fallout is another massive franchise where if you haven't heard about it in some way, I don't know how or why you're watching this. But as a very brief rundown for those in the dark, Fallout is a post-apocalyptic role-playing game set in various regions of an alternate history, United States. The games have been handled by a few different studios, including Bethesda, who handled Fallout 3, 4, and 76, Obsidian Entertainment, who developed Fallout New Vegas, and Interplay Entertainment, who were behind the original games, including Fallout 1, 2, and Tactics. And we don't talk about Brotherhood of Steel. The series has light horror elements, mostly consisting of body horror, with all kinds of mutated creatures and experiments, and has a ton of dark themes, such as slavery, cannibalism, rape, disease, science experiments, corrupt governments, and more. This is a super easy franchise to get into if you've never played it, and I highly recommend trying at least a couple of these games. A good starting point would either be with Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 4. Majora's Mask is pretty famous for being the darker counterpart to Ocarina of Time. The game is infamous for all kinds of things, such as the three-day countdown to complete Annihilation, the depressing side quests, and the theories surrounding the game. The basic plot of the game is that it's set a few months after the events of Ocarina of Time. Link finds himself in a parallel world to Hyrule called Termina, and he's tasked by the happy mask salesman to find a certain mask. Within Termina, Link discovers that the moon is going to crash into the world in three days. If he fails to complete his journey within the three days, there will be complete annihilation. While not actually part of the game, it's hard to talk about the dark and disturbing elements of Majora's Mask without mentioning the creepypasta Ben Drowned, as it's one of the most iconic internet stories of all time. But all it's going to get is a mention, because we don't have all day. Diablo is another heavy hitter, this time by Blizzard, so I'll keep this brief, as it's pretty obvious how this game is dark just by the title alone. The games are action RPGs with hellish and actual hell imagery and settings, having your character fight monsters and demons to collect epic loot. It's notable that the series has received heavy backlash in the last few years, with games like Diablo Immortal being very pay to win. With that said, the originals, especially Diablo 2, are regarded as some of the best ARPGs of all time, so give them a shot if you haven't. The Max Payne series was developed by Remedy Entertainment and Rockstar Games, and was one of the first games to heavily incorporate slow-mo after its massive rise in popularity after the Matrix movies. The series follows hard-boiled detective Max Payne as he uncovers various conspiracies in New York and later Brazil in Max Payne 3. The series has most of its darkest and most disturbing elements in the first game, where Max's wife and infant daughter are murdered. Max is riddled with guilt and sorrow, and it leads to one of the best platforming sections in any game. Since I've shouted out upcoming remakes previously, it's worth noting that Remedy is remaking the first two games, so this series will be easier to jump into than ever, in a few years or whenever it comes out, so be on the lookout. Until done, now this is a fun one. This game harkens back to classic slasher movies, letting you play as a bunch of different college kids in the mountains on vacation. Without spoiling anything, the group can either escape the predicament they find themselves in, or all die trying. This is definitely a game you don't want spoilers going into, so if you're into 80s slashers, this is definitely worth checking out. Just keep in mind that gameplay-wise, it really isn't anything special, and it's more of a story and atmosphere-based game. Another classic of what I call tuber horror, SCP Containment Breach came out in 2012 and is one of the major driving forces that led to SCP becoming as popular as it is today. In the game he plays a Class D prisoner, basically someone with a death sentence who has been recruited to deal with dangerous, usually Keter class SCPs. While the game, I don't 
think is receiving updates anymore, it has led to a multitude of other games and projects being inspired by it, as anyone can create an SCP project. This is definitely worth checking out, especially if you're a fan of SCP, because while it's a bit dated and gluey, it still has its moments. Now I'm gonna be honest. In terms of pure scare factor or darkness, Doom 3 is really the only game that fits on this iceberg. Maybe Doom 64. Seeing as only Doom 3 fits, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but if you've ever wanted a Doom game that takes yourself kinda seriously, check out Doom 3. As for what Doom is, you play as the Doom guy, fighting through hell, battling demons, and killing demons, and killing more demons. That's pretty much it. I have something in my script about saying it's a horror game where you play as the monster, but that's so fucking cringe and overplayed, I'm not even gonna bother. Due to being developed by Telltale, this is obviously another heavily story-focused game, like Heavy Rain and Until Dawn. So, quickly going over it, if you know Telltale games, and you know the concept of this thing called zombies, then you'll get what this game will be like. Without spoilers, this game really does have an outstanding story, with plenty of choices and emotional moments, and you do not have to be a fan of the Walking Dead TV show or comic to enjoy it. Essentially, if you're a fan of Telltale-style games, and you haven't played at least the first season of this, it's really worth giving a playthrough. While not a tuber classic like Slender, Doki Doki is definitely a tuber reaction game. If you've never heard of this game and are seeing it here, you might be wondering why it's on the iceberg. All I'll say is that it's on the list for a reason. Going into it much more than that would kind of ruin the game. So if you want a visual novel with a twist, give it a shot. It's free. Everyone knows Mortal Kombat, so I won't go over it too much here. If you somehow don't, all you need to know is that it's a violent and gory fighting game that was huge in the 90s and is still going strong today. Since everyone knows Mortal Kombat, I'll throw in a fun fact. It was one of the main games that contributed to the creation of the ESRB, along with the game Night Trap. If you don't know what the ESRB is, it's those little ratings you see in the corner of every game. Another not very spooky or dark entry, Dying Light is a parkour based zombie game. For the sake of time, I'm not really going to go into it too much deeper than that, but fun fact about Dying Light, since its release in 2015, it has received constant updates that are still ongoing even with the sequel being released. I will say though, this game does get pretty scary at night then with the super zombies. From the same devs as Amnesia and Penumbra, Soma is a post-apocalyptic horror game that puts forward a lot of dark philosophical questions, especially in its ending. You play as Simon, in a deep sea base which is the last remnant of humanity after a comet struck the earth. The base is filled with robots who believe they're human, and that's all I'll say because the game really is great and any major spoilers would lessen the game's impact. Fun fact, Hatred is one of the only non-Zorn games to receive an adults-only rating, with San Andreas and Manhunt 2 being the only other two notable ones. As for what Hatred is, it's a pretty fucking dog shit game, being a twin-stick edgelord simulator where you just kill people because people bad. I kinda gave up writing notes for this one, so my only other points are at the end you nuke New York and the game sucks. I really shouldn't have to explain why a mass murder simulator is on the iceberg. Pendy and the Ink Machine is a 2017 game with heavy inspiration from classic cartoons from the golden age of animation. Since this is another story focused game, all I can really talk about is that it definitely has style, just from looking at it. This is also one I haven't played, so I can't really speak further on it than that, but if it looks good to you, give it a shot. I've heard mixed things about the gameplay and story, and especially about the studio itself, so do some proper research beforehand. While Rockstar Games are primarily known for Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption nowadays, back in the 2000s they were pumping out all kinds of different games, with Manhunt 1 and 2 being some of them. After Grand Theft Auto, these are without a doubt their most controversial games, and as mentioned earlier, Manhunt 2 is one of the only AAA developed games to receive an adults only rating from the ESRB. As for gameplay and story, Manhunt follows a death row prisoner in the fictional city of Carcer City, who is forced to brutally kill gang members on camera for snuff films. That's all there really is to it, lots of killing and brutal violence. As a fun fact, Manhunt is in a shared universe with Grand Theft Auto, the number of different references in the games, with one specific one being that Michael from Grand Theft Auto V took his first big score in Carcer City. Little Nightmares is a heavily stylized horror puzzle platformer where you take control of a little girl named Six. 
The game has stealth elements, with sneaking typically being the only way to get past enemies. This is another one I have yet to play, but it does look interesting, and has clearly made an impact as it has both a sequel out and a threequel in development, so check it out if you're interested. PT, short for Playable Teaser, is definitely another tuber reaction game. And as an aside, I want to say, when I say tuber reaction game, that doesn't mean bad at all. In PT, you control Norman Reedus as he walks down a hallway. In all seriousness, PT is a really great game that has hours of things you could talk about. From the Kojima Konami controversy, story, connections to other games like Metal Gear Solid 5, and more. But this isn't a PT iceberg. If you want a decent little rundown of PT, check out the video by Gamers, which goes into more detail on the subject. Fun fact, while PS4s with PT installed are insanely expensive, the entire game has been remade on PC. So check that out if you want to play PT, as it was removed from stores years ago. Moving on to the best game on the iceberg, and it's not even a debate, Bloodborne is FromSoft's best game. If you somehow have never heard about Bloodborne, it's a Lovecraftian, Souls-like game set in the city of Yarnum. The game basically tells you to your face, the story doesn't matter, go kill. And that's exactly what you do. While it's not necessarily horror, the game is definitely FromSoft's darkest entry to date, with horror elements such as the grotesque monster designs, and I mean, fuck, Ludwig still kinda creeps me out with how he looks. If you haven't played Bloodborne, play Bloodborne. And if you don't have a PlayStation to play it, get a PlayStation to play it. Nier is a series of third-person hack and slashy JRPGs, and uh, that's all I've got. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't played these, so gameplay-wise I can't really comment. As for stories, these definitely aren't horror games, but from what I've read, they can absolutely get pretty dark. As for if you should play these, you're gonna have to do your own research there, because I'm not really qualified to give that recommendation. I do know Nier Automata is highly regarded, and, I mean, hey, it's worth a shot if it looks cool. Another survival horror game, this time set in the Alien universe, Alien Isolation has you playing as the daughter of the film's protagonist, named Amanda Ripley. The basic plot rundown is that she has come looking for her mother, and after finding out about the iconic xenomorph, she's got a blast. This one is a lot of fun and definitely worth a try whether you're a fan of the movie or not, as it doesn't really need any deep lore knowledge of the Alien universe to understand what's going on. Yet another prime example of a tuber game. Hello Neighbor started out as a promising little demo, with cool dynamically reactive AI elements from the neighbor. The game has the protagonist trying to break into the neighbor's house to look into his basement. Since I said no spoilers early on, that's all you'll get. But, I mean, come on. It's a creepy neighbor with a creepy basement. There's gonna be weird shit in it. This game is a fucking train wreck, and I do not recommend playing it. Definite skip as it turned into YouTuber bait as it went on. Dead by Daylight is a competitive PvP love letter to various horror properties across all different mediums. The game has one killer pitted up against four survivors, who need to escape each map by activating generators to escape, while the killer needs to incapacitate the survivors and slam them onto meat hooks. This is definitely a fun game, especially with some friends, and it's really cool to have all these different horror franchises within one space. This is sort of the Smash Bros of horror media. This one is less dark and scary than most on the list, but if you enjoy the others on the list, then it's a perfect game to play with the boys. Danganronpa, excuse me if I'm saying that wrong, has a bunch of different entries, and I'm not really familiar with the franchise, so please forgive me if I'm dead fucking wrong on something here. But from what I've gathered, it's mainly about high school kids killing each other because of the iconic bear. Seeing as it's a visual novel and pretty story focused, going into it much farther than a base level would probably end up spoiling some things. So if the premise sounds interesting, check it out. Binding of Isaac is a Zelda-inspired roguelike with heavy religious themes and imagery, so if that sounds interesting, give it a shot if you haven't already. The Binding of Isaac is one of the main players when it comes to the last decade or so's popularization of roguelikes, so if you're a fan of them and somehow haven't played Isaac, give it your money. Now, this is another one of those games where I feel like almost everyone has at least heard of it or seen it, especially with multiple re-releases and expansions, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. Death Stranding is a delivery service game where Norman Reedus moves boxes across the country. In all seriousness though, this is a Kojima game. If you don't know the name, it's the guy behind Metal Gear. Now this is a personal opinion, but Kojima stories are better to go into fully blind. So if the delivery service part sounds appealing, give this game a shot. 
Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 are co-op zombie shooters developed on the Source engine in-house at Valve, who created the Source engine and other things like Half-Life, Team Fortress 2, and Steam. The games aren't necessarily dark or scary, but they definitely can be in certain moments, usually involving witches. These games are usually dirt cheap on Steam, so grab a couple buddies and hop in to kill some zombies. Since the main twist, Eternal Darkness pulls on the player are both very well known and completely outdated, full spoilers for this one. Eternal Darkness is very similar to classic Resident Evil games, being a survival horror where you fight spooky monsters and shit, which differentiated itself based on the most iconic feature, fucking with the player. Eternal Darkness has a sanity system where depending on how fucked up you are in the game, the game will fuck with you, the player, breaking the fourth wall in a ton of different, massively dated ways. Some of the sanity effects are things like turning your TV's volume down, a screen congratulating the player for completing the demo, and the TV swapping to video mode. All pretty cool effects for the time, which would have likely been insane if you went in blind at release. A Japanese murder mystery visual novel series. When They Cry is a story of a fella moving into a new town with his parents, which has a curse associated with it, where every year one person mysteriously dies and another disappears which may or may not be connected to a god the town worships. The series inspired a pretty huge anime, so I thought that was worth noting, because I can pretty safely say that the game series is in the shadows of the anime popularity-wise, which, to my knowledge, doesn't really ever happen, especially with western titles that have had TV shows. One odd thing I found on the series' fandom wiki was that there were talks of the series being an inspiration or leading factor in multiple real-life murders, which the series even acknowledged in an advertising campaign. In the end, they came out and said that the series wasn't to blame, with backing from a University of Tokyo professor, who also asserted that the series wasn't to blame. If I've gotten anything mixed up regarding this whole ordeal, please let me know, but I felt it was too interesting not to talk about. System Shock 1 and 2 are immersive sims from the 90s that at this point are most notable for being the lead inspirations for Deus Ex and Bioshock. While the first game is notable, the second is much more of a cult classic. In the games, you battle parasitic aliens while having to deal with a nearly unstoppable rogue AI. Again, since this is the first couple tiers, and a remake of the first game is maybe eventually coming out, I'll leave it at that. But if you're a fan of immersive sims like Deus Ex, definitely give these two a try if you haven't. They're classics. Omori is another indie RPG golden child similar to Undertale. Released in 2020, this is another very story-based game, and because of the recent release, I'll keep it completely spoiler-free, as a ton of people have yet to play it. So I'll just read off the official Steam description. Explore a strange world full of colorful friends and foes. Navigate through the vibrant and the mundane in order to uncover a forgotten past. When the time comes, the path you've chosen will determine your fate, and perhaps the fate of others as well. If you've never heard of the American McGee's Alice games, they're essentially action-adventure retellings of the Alice in Wonderland novels, while also having a much darker and gloomier atmosphere, such as her family dying in a house fire, which leaves her with severe psychological damage. Since everyone knows the general plot of Alice in Wonderland, I feel I can leave it at that. Just for a quick fun fact about American McGee, he was a level designer on the original two Doom games back in the 90s. Probably the last major tuber game on the iceberg, Baldi's Basics is a horror parody of all those classic 90s to early 2000s edutainment games you'd see in school libraries back in the day, mainly being based on Sonic's schoolhouse. The game has you playing as a student collecting notebooks while avoiding the titular character, where if he catches you, you'll need to solve a math equation, which eventually becomes impossible. The game is notable for its AI elements, playing with sound and luring Baldi away from where you are. The game is also free, so if this interests you, check it out. And an expanded version, Baldi's Basics Plus, is currently in early access on Steam. Yume Nikki is an iconic game that served as inspiration for a shit ton of different projects. I feel like trying to talk about this game properly on an iceberg would do it a disservice, so I'd recommend either playing the game yourself or checking out one of the various video essays on the game that are still coming out to this day. A good recent one came out by Sagan Hawks, so check that out. As for a basic basic hook for the game, you navigate a girl's dreams and nightmares, which usually have a dark or at least unnerving atmosphere. The game is free on Steam, so it's at least worth a shot. Seeing as there are other Corpse Party entries on the iceberg way below, I'm only going to go over the first entry here. 
Corpse Party is an RPG maker game, originally released in 1996. It follows a group exploring a haunted school looking for a way to escape. I feel like this one is so high because it laid the groundwork and was essentially the OG RPG maker horror game, which obviously inspired a metric fuckton of similar games in the coming years and even today, a ton of which are on this iceberg. The Postal franchise is only on here because it's dark and disturbing, in an edgy sense. These games aren't creepy or spooky. If you've never heard of it, Postal is basically a fuck around and do whatever you want series. Which could include just being a regular guy, killing people, or pissing on them and shoving a gun up a cat's ass to use as a suppressor. And that's all I really have to say on these games. Yandere Sim is similar to Hello Neighbor, with an insanely troubled development, which honestly could be a whole iceberg itself, and I'd be incredibly fucking surprised if no one's done something similar to that. As for the actual game, you play as a high school girl trying to get with a crush, killing different rivals so that you can achieve your ultimate goal of Zex. The game itself is still unfinished even though development began in 2014, so eyes peeled, I guess. If you want a real in-depth look at the development of Yandere Sim, there are, and I'm not kidding, hundreds of videos going over everything about this game, both negative and positive. Tier 2. I'm still going to try and avoid spoilers on more recent games, but this is the warning point that games are going to start getting spoiled. At this point, it will also be less of a you should check this out kind of list and more explanations from this point on, especially once we get past this tier. Parasite E was a 90s action RPG by Squaresoft, which is mainly based around biological horror like in Resident Evil. The original follows New York cop Ayabria as she tries to save the world from turning into slime from this clown looking memo. The series is pretty cool if a little dated, so if you can find a copy and enjoy JRPGs and the Resident Evil series, give this one a try. I'm going to start this off by saying this game was a massive disappointment and I specifically remember the initial reveals of this game going around. It looks stylish and cool, then the game dropped and it was a survival game? Yeah, this game was in development during the peak of survival games popularity. If you enjoyed this game, power to you, but gameplay wise it really didn't live up to its hype. As for spooky and dark elements, the game has themes of fitting in, dystopia, and medication abuse. While gameplay wise it's pretty mediocre, if these story elements interest you it may be worth checking out. Another 90s classic series, Clock Tower is the series responsible for the iconic and the legendary Scissor Man. The original is a point and click horror game where you play as Jennifer Simpson, who was adopted by a wealthy fella named Simon Barrows, and they live in a mansion known as the Clock Tower. Yada yada, skip a couple scenes and her fellow adopted siblings are dead and she's being chased by the iconic Scissor Man. It's a classic slasher story, so if you're into that it's still worth playing. As for the sequels, don't really know what the fuck is going on in the sequels, if I'm going to be honest. This War of Mine is a survival game focusing on the civilians of war. The goal is to help keep a group of survivors alive through gathering whatever materials and supplies you can manage. If you're on this iceberg primarily looking for horror games, this probably won't be your cup of tea. But it is an impactful game nonetheless. Now this is one I had not even heard of before researching for this iceberg and it looks pretty creepy from what I've seen. The game follows a young girl dealing with severe mental illness after witnessing the murder of her parents. She's admitted to an asylum where the pills she's administered give her vivid hallucinations. This is another one definitely worth looking into if you like psychological horror and puzzle games. Undebatable fact about Deadly Premonition. The song Life is Beautiful is more well known than the game itself. Back on topic, Deadly Premonition is a survival horror game with actual survival game elements like eating, sleeping, and not being a fucking disgusting slob. And by that I mean the game has shaving and changing clothes. The game is a detective game, so going into the plot at any level of detail might ruin it for some people. So if you haven't played it, the basic premise is that you're investigating a murder, which branches out into a story involving more murder and supernatural elements. That's what I'll leave it at. Dino Crisis. The short, Resident Evil, but with dinosaurs. The long, Resident Evil, but with space-time distortions leading to dinosaurs being brought back. But seriously, Dino Crisis is pretty much the original Resident Evil games with dinosaurs. But that's pretty cool, who doesn't love dinosaurs? Thief is a game where you play as a thief, 
in a city named The City. As for why it's on the Spooky Games Iceberg, the game does have a couple scary levels where you fight zombies and ghosts, and a few levels do incorporate survival horror elements. If you're looking for a dark or real horror game, Thief wouldn't be my first choice, but it's still a great game. Limbo is a 2D walking sim and platformer, dripping with a spooky and ominous atmosphere. It's hard to talk about this game as the story is pretty much entirely visual, but the basic plot is that you're on a little journey to find your sister in this colorblind world. Fatal Frame is a pretty unique series where you explore haunted locations and fight ghosts by taking pictures of them with a gamer camera. The game is set in 80s Japan. The protagonist Miku Hanasaki explores a spooky haunted mansion, uncovering the dark, spooky rituals that happen there while fighting ghosts. Indigo Prophecy, known as Fahrenheit in North America, is a 2005 action-adventure by Quantic Dream, the same developers behind Heavy Rain and Detroit Become Human. Similar to other Quantic Dream games, Indigo Prophecy features multiple playable characters and is more of an interactive movie than a game, meaning I'm going to keep it light on plot details. All I'm going to say is that the plot revolves around playing as a possessed murderer and the police detectives that are trying to solve his case. I don't really know if I agree with Turok being on this iceberg, but I'm covering all the entries, so I'll keep it brief. In Turok, you play as your boy Turok, killing dinosaurs and other goons in your way. That's pretty much it. Solid boomer shooter, and there's a modern port of it and its sequel on Steam, so they're readily available to play. Darkest Dungeon is a gothic RPG where you gather a gang of goons to go on expeditions into a dungeon to kill fucking everything inside and explore for cool stuff. This one is mainly on here for the dark visuals, which are pretty gnarly, but also pretty cool. I mean, the game is literally called Darkest Dungeon. Papers Plays is a puzzle game where you play as an immigration officer for the fictional country of Arstotska. In the game, you need to discern between real and fake passports and manage your own personal finances to provide for your family's needs. Obviously, in terms of themes, Papers, Please deals with terrorism and police states. A lot of the darker moments in the gameplay are spoilery events, but one thing I'll say is that your family can pretty easily die if you fuck up at all, so you really need to stay focused. This one's pretty popular, so I'm going to leave it at that, but if you've somehow never heard of it, look into it. It's a cool game. The Lisa series consists of three games. One is a Yume Nikki inspired game about a fucked up family in a fucked up world. The other two are side-scrolling RPGs inspired by Earthbound. The second game, Lisa the Painful, is exactly that. And if you're going to play this, I recommend looking at the smallest amount of details you can before making your decision. Because this is another one on the iceberg that's best gone into as blind as possible. Eversion is a side-scrolling platformer where you have the ability to shift dimensions to create new platforms to progress through levels in an alternate dimension. This power becomes increasingly fucked up as the alternate dimension is very dark, grim, and full of blood. Onimusha is a supernatural hack and slash game from Capcom set in the Sengoku period of Japan's history. The first game in the series is a light survival horror similar to Resident Evil as it is by Capcom. One downside to being owned by Capcom, however, is that the series is pretty much completely finished, due to falling sales. Besides the creepy monsters, it's a regular action game with a cool samurai setting. Originally a mod for Half-Life 1, Cry of Fear became a full game itself, being a psychological horror experience based around themes of depression, isolation, and dread. I'm going to try and avoid major spoilers for this one, especially as this game is free and definitely worth playing. But if you have played it and want some excellent analysis of the game, check out Who is Simon by The Batesy, which is a 40 minute deep dive into the main character Simon and various other plot elements. One of the only major cosmic horror games along with Bloodborne, Call of Cthulhu is a 2018 survival horror game by Cyanide Studio, famous for other games like their iconic Pro Cycling Simulator, Season 2006. The game is inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's book of the same name. The game revolves around a detective sent in to investigate the death of the Hawkins family. Of course, being a Lovecraftian cosmic horror game, it goes much deeper than that. Similar to a few other games on the iceberg, this game has sanity elements that do affect the outcome of the game, and it's always neat when games do that. The first and possibly only VR original on the iceberg, Duck Season is a short little horror game where, without spoiling too much, the basic premise is what if duck hunt, but spooky. 
That's all I can really say about it without spoiling anything, but if you're interested and don't have a VR headset, there is a fully playable desktop version that was also released on Steam. So peep it out if this sounds interesting. So a bit earlier I talked about bending the ink machine and how the company creating it has had some controversy around it. Well, this game is no different, with the same studio being behind Showdown Bandit. The game was an episodic top-down stealth horror game where you play as the rootin' tootin' bandit in a spooky dilapidated puppet show set. Sadly, the controversy arose when the company decided, Fellas, this game isn't bringing in the big bucks. Put a lid on it. And then they shit-canned it after one episode. So if you're planning on playing it, good luck, because it's also removed from shelves. The OG horror series from Frictional Games, who we've talked about multiple times already with their other games Soma and Amnesia. Penumbra is similar to the others, with signature staples like being able to open drawers and doors. The game is very similar to their more recent titles gameplay-wise, obviously with more jank as it was a 2007 game, while the setting is very different, having you explore an old mine after it collapses in on you, and finding out what happened to those who were there before you. If you've enjoyed Frictional's other titles, definitely set aside some time to play these classics. Metro was an FPS series developed by 4A, set in post-apocalyptic Russia, with the series spending a lot of time in old metro tunnels where most people live after the apocalypse. The series, especially Exodus, features plenty of mutant animals living on the surface, which is one of the main reasons humanity dwells in the metro tunnels. This is a very cool series based on the novels of the same name, and is definitely worth checking out. Stalker is similar to Metro's general setting, but otherwise is slightly more based on reality. In the series, you play as various characters in the area surrounding Chernobyl, the Exclusion Zone, known in-universe simply as The Zone. In the series, you fight mutants, nature, anomalies, and other stalkers in order to survive, collecting artifacts and making your way further into the zone. This is one of my favorite series, and if you haven't played it, definitely check it out, especially with Stalker 2 coming out in the near future. Night in the Woods is a heavily story and dialogue based light platformer, and with the emphasis on story over everything, I'll keep it light. Night in the Woods has you, a college dropout, moving back in with your parents in your hometown, seeing how much everything and everyone has changed since you've been gone, eventually uncovering a spooky dark secret the town holds. The game has a cute art style and is light on gameplay, so if you're looking for something to just sit back and relax to while playing, this is worth checking out. Layers of Fear is a psychological horror game where you play as a painter painting paintings with paint. Without spoilers, the game has you exploring your home, uncovering the dark details of your past while you aim to finish your magnum opus. Like most others on the tier, Layers of Fear heavily promotes its story, and as I'm not aiming to spoil much on these first couple tiers, I'll leave it at that. The game has a sequel, simply Layers of Fear 2, as well as a third game in the works which as of writing is called Layers of Fears. Which, um... They should probably think of renaming, because it's very confusing. While more recently this game has been kind of forgotten about, I remember a few years ago everyone knew the twist this game had, because at the time, they were very hard-hitting. Especially given that COD and Battlefield were at their absolute peaks. I won't spoil anything major here, as I'm sure there are plenty of people who have yet to play, but the game's main shtick is that it does not shy away from betraying PTSD and very graphic war crimes with one very standout scene that everyone who's played the game remembers. If you haven't played this and don't know what happens, I highly recommend going in completely blind if you do decide to play it. Splatterhouse was originally a horror-themed beat-em-up from the late 80s, making it one of, if not the oldest games on the iceberg so far. The game had a reimagining in 2010, and has you fighting meat monsters with meat cleavers and blood and meat and blood and meat and blood and meat. Overall, the series is pretty simply a horror-themed beat-em-up and not much more, with you fighting meaty monsters and with plenty of blood and gore. Among the Sleep is a horror game where you play as a wee two-year-old lad, woken up in the night trying to find his mom in a weird, wacky world. The game really plays up being a two-year-old to its fullest, with you not being able to run for more than a few seconds without falling over, or not being able to reach certain door handles. This is a really unique premise for a game, so if you've ever wanted to live out the fantasy of being a little baby boy, give it a shot. 
a series of five dark fantasy action-adventure vampire games. The Legacy of Kane series ran from the late 90s to the mid-2000s. The games are still highly praised for their presentation and voice acting and storytelling, with the series having themes of destiny versus free will, tragedy, manipulation, redemption, and more. For their time, and even now, these games have excellent writing and stories and still hold up in that regard. I'm Lucius. I'm Lucius. Hello, nurse. Hey, what's going on, guy? I'm Lucius. I'm Lucius. I'm gonna take over your fucking mind. Lucius has you playing as a dastardly devil boy, causing chaos in your parents' luxurious estate, killing people with your dastardly devil boy powers. The game is kind of shit, I'm not gonna lie, but it and its sequels can be worth playing if you just want to fuck around with the NPCs. Dark Deception is a first-person spooky maze game where you're chased by funny monkeys. The game is split into chapters, where each chapter offers new enemies to run from and new areas to explore. The game can be described as Horror Pac-Man, which is a pretty cool concept to me. Check that out if it sounds interesting to you, especially as the first chapter's free. Love Love. What first presents itself as a romantic visual novel turns into a war epic with billions of casualties and most of Eurasia being wiped out by the time the second half of the first game starts. That's about as far as I can go without major spoilers, so if you want a visual novel with a crazy turn in direction halfway through, this is worth playing. As an aside, this game is notable for being the first one on the iceberg with the purple tag. Now, in case you've forgotten, the purple tag represents a visual novel game that has a Zorn patch. Welcome to the Game is a very unique horror game, with the player accessing a fictional version of the deep web to gain access to a red room, while warding off hackers and a kidnapper trying to enter your home. Before having access to the red room, the player needs to find 8 access keys in various other websites which are also on the deep web, taking them all over to search for them. The sequel has a similar premise, with the player needing to find 8 hashes to decrypt the shadow web browser, while having to deal with even more threats like police, hitmen, and more. Overall, this series is very unique, and takes on internet horror and mysteries within games are always fun. What Remains of Edith Finch is one of those games as an art form type of games, where its story and presentation are very well regarded, so I'll keep this one short in case it piques your interest. What Remains of Edith Finch is an adventure game that was released in 2017. The Finch family has a curse on them, which causes all but one family member to die in unusual ways each generation. Again, this is one of those games you're better off experiencing yourself with minimal spoilers, so we'll quickly move on. The first green entry on list, which as a reminder stands for mods and fan games, is the Halloween Hack. Released in 2008 by Undertale developer Toby Fox, Halloween Hack is a mod for Earthbound taking place in an alternate timeline where the gang never made it back after fighting Gygus. You play as bounty hunter Varric and are tasked with hunting down a monster. That's what I'll leave it at, because to be honest, if it wasn't Toby Fox who had made this, it probably wouldn't be as close to as well known as it is now. Toby Fox has even stated that it was just, quote, a bad ROM hack with swears. So take that as you will. If you're a huge fan of Undertale or Deltarune, and somehow haven't heard of this, it can't hurt to give it a shot, but just don't expect the same level of quality as those games if you do decide to try it. A first person horror game from 2017, Home Sweet Home is unique in that it features Taiwanese horror and is inspired by Thai myths and legends. You play as Tim, whose wife disappeared mysteriously, leading him into a deep sorrow. He wakes up in a strange place and is hunted by a female spirit. The game is stealth-focused and has some puzzles too, so if you're looking for a shooty gun boom boom, this probably won't be your cup of tea. Killer7 is one of those games where I could fully explain the plot and you would probably still go, what? What the fuck? So I'll skip that part and just say it's an on-rails shooter made by some big shots in the Japanese gaming industry. With some major players in its development being Suda51, Shinji Mikami, and Hiroyuki Kobayashi. The game features the Killer7, an elite assassin group, taking on various hit jobs throughout the United States, and mainly dealing with the terrorist force known as Heaven Smiles along the way. The game dives deep into psychological aspects, politics, war, religion and cults, inner conflict, and dissociative identity disorder. It also has the best staircase music in any game. If you're into weird Japanese action games with insane plots such as the Metal Gear series, give this a shot as it got ported to Steam a few years ago in widescreen and 60fps. Freaking sweet. 
Another game on here by Supermassive, the creators of Until Dawn, the Dark Pictures Anthology is a series of mid-length cooperative horror experiences. As there are four games in one, and one is yet to be released, I'll skip on plot and just say that gameplay-wise, it's like Until Dawn but with co-op in various settings. Based on a book that the co-designer of the game wrote by the same name, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is a 90s point-and-click game in a post-apocalyptic dystopian setting where an AI rules over the final five survivors of the human race, keeping them alive and torturing them for decades. This is one of those games where a lot of people have heard of it because it has a really unique title and is a cult classic, but very few people have actually played it because it's old and fucked up. If you want to play this game, I would probably recommend just watching a playthrough, because like most 90s point and click games, there's a lot of random clicking on shit until something works. A short puzzle solving horror game, Bobby's Playtime is an indie horror game that took off after the indie horror boom created by FNAF. The game takes place in an abandoned toy factory, with toys chasing after you. It's episodic, currently only having two chapters out, with the first being free if you want to give it a shot. I don't really have anything else to say about this one, it's pretty standard with nothing to stand out about it. There was some controversy with the creators or something too, but I didn't look into it because I, I really don't care. A 2019 indie adventure game created by Kill Monday Games, Little Misfortune is set in the same universe as Fran Boat, which I went over briefly earlier. Since the game is another that's primarily about story over gameplay, I'll just say that the story has misfortune, make various choices along a path, and all have different outcomes. The game deals with things like the fourth wall, dimensions, and abuse. The game has middling reviews, but is praised for its art, voice acting, and themes. That Dragon, Cancer, is an exploration game built around the personal experience the developer had with the loss of his own son to cancer. The game shows their struggles with both the condition and more personal struggles with their religion. Superliminal is a puzzle game based around perspective. In short, by looking around while holding an object, you can make it bigger or smaller depending on your perspective. The game isn't necessarily scary or dark, but it does have a few unnerving moments. Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth is a survival horror game from 2005, and like the 2018 game, it's also based on the Call of Cthulhu story by H.P. Lovecraft. The game specifically is based around the novella The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which follows Jack Walters, a private detective investigating the town of Innsmouth, which has cut itself off from the rest of the United States. In terms of gameplay, this is your standard survival horror, with limited ammo and healing. One cool feature is that the game doesn't have a HUD meaning your current condition is given to you through audio cues from your heartbeat and breathing. Another cool feature that is similar to a few other games on here, Dark Corners of the Earth features a sanity system, which can lead to hallucinations, permanent insanity, or suicide. Sadly, this game was a complete bomb and bankrupted the studio behind it, so this was the first and only game in a planned trilogy. From the same studio as Dead Space, Visceral Games, Dante's Inferno was a 2010 action-adventure game released for the PS3, PSP, and Xbox 360. The game has Dante, a Templar Knight, fighting through the nine circles of hell to rescue his fiancée Beatrice from Lucifer himself. Now it'd be reasonable to end the video on that, as the game itself doesn't need much more explanation. But we've gotta talk about the marketing for this game. Before release, EA decided they were gonna fuck with game journalists in a bunch of different ways. One of which was by sending packages to them that rickrolled the journalist, which could only be turned off by smashing it with a hammer contained in the package. Upon doing so, journalists would find a note telling them that they gave in to wrath. Another stunt came when EA sent out $200 checks to journalists, with journalists either accepting the money and giving in to greed, or denying it and suffering for prodigality. EA also created a fake ad for the game called Mass We Pray. A family shouldn't have to wait until Sunday to worship the Lord. Amen. Now you can go to church every day without leaving your home. Introducing Mass We Pray. The wireless cross controller detects movement in three dimensions. Every twist of the hand and nuance of a blessing is recreated on screen. Use it to participate in more than 24 unique and exhilarating ceremonies. When trying to pre-order Mass We Pray, the website warned the user of hearsay and told them to buy Dante's Inferno instead. Last but not least, EA hired an entire group of fake protesters to protest outside their offices. Is it dumb? It is! It is! It is. It is. Yes, it is! It is. It is. Amen! Amen. My high score is in heaven, I don't know about yours. Um, hey, 
Um, so what are you guys protesting? We're here to protest Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno, the game by Electronic Arts, Electronic Inside Price. Um, so uh, what do you know about the game? Uh, we know that... Hey, anyone that's left, just a quick heads up that it's possible I cover one or two things between this and the next part. Don't worry, this entire thing will be covered in due time. Just a heads up, next part is when we start getting into real unknown territory with a lot of obscure games, and mods, fan games, Zorn games. So, you know, be prepared for that. Also, spoilers are going to be full effect next time. I'm not going to warn you, I'm not going to say, hey, check this out. I'm not going to warn about story or anything like that. It's going to be full explanations. Besides that, thanks for sticking around and stay tuned for more. Goodbye.